Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. If your roof starts to leak or your floors really squeak, you live in a money pit. Money pit. If your basement needs a pump or your place looks like a dump, you live in a money pit. Money pit. Pick up the telephone, fix up your home sweet home by calling 888 Money Pit. The Money Pit is presented by Dush Coatings. Now, here are Tom and Leslie. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. And we are here for you, especially if you are a home improver, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, if you want to take on projects around your house to make it more safe, more comfortable, more beautiful, more ready for the holidays that are coming up oh so quickly, reach out to us with your questions. We've been at this for a long time, and if you've got a question, I bet you we've got an answer that will help you save some money, save some time, and really improve your space. The number here is one eight 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 Money Pit. That's eight 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 six 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 three nine seven four. Or for the fastest possible response, just go to moneypit.com slash ask and click the blue microphone button. Coming up on today's episode, if you own an older home, would you buy another old home the next time around? Well, a new survey says that 50% of Americans would not. We're going to look at the cost to maintain a home in the top five states with the oldest homes just ahead. And if you've got a sprinkler system for your lawn, now is the time when that system needs to be winterized. You do not want to see what happens when it's not. Trust me, happened to Tom once, and it can be a real (laughs) mess. We're going to explain what needs to happen to avoid that frozen mess just ahead. And also ahead, when it comes to maintaining your home, painting is the most basic of DIY projects. But it's also a project that can go terribly wrong if you don't do just three things before you start. So we'll share those steps just ahead. But first, we're here to offer some expert help for the care and feeding of your home and help you create your best home ever, help you tackle all of those to-dos with confidence, and get all of those projects off the to-do list to the to-done list. We are standing by to give a hand. The number here is one eight 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 Money Pit eight 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 six 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 three nine seven four. Let's get to it, Leslie. Who's first? Stephen in Arkansas, you've got the Money Pit. How can we help you today? I've got this porch. It's got really, really old wood. I guess it's about fifteen, twenty years old. Anyway, I cut it up to make a long, shorter porch, and I. Uh, weather protected it about two years ago with Thompson Water Seal, which it did a job. It just turned pretty looking wood into ugly wood and I water treated it now I got my wood back and I want to treat it again but I don't want it to go ugly on me <laughs> you don't want it to go ugly on you huh right yeah. well what's the what kind of wood is the floor Stephen? I'm pretty sure it's pine pine okay so what, what I would recommend you do is apply a solid stain to that floor because a solid color stain is going to have enough pigment in it where you'll see the grain come through it but it's not gonna it's not gonna wear off and go ugly on you as you say. Solid color staining is what we use on decks. It's also what we use on porch floors. It's not like paint. It's it's stained, but it, it but it uh, is going to show that green. Okay. Do I, I don't need to water seal it after that? You do not. It's all it's all built in. All right. So look for solid color wood stain, uh, and and that'll do it. Oh man, I appreciate that because I was I was dreading it, you know, because I mean it, it's just pretty to look at. I, I mean, it's got nice good textured wood. You know, and then and, and I just remember what happened. I said, "Man, I just don't want to do that again." You know. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of work just to use the sealer and stop right there because what happens is the UV radiation from the sun gets to it. It breaks down the wood fibers and it starts to gray out on you. So, if you use a solid color stain and you can go right on top of what's there now, just make sure it's clean. Uh, you'll be good to go. Yeah, we just got to. Uh pressure washing it. That's what got all the uh, the tons of water still up. Yeah, just make sure it, it dries thoroughly before you stain it, okay? Hey, man, I appreciate you. And I listen to y'all all the time. Y'all are great. All right. Thank you so much. Good luck with that project. Now, we've got Floyd in Iowa on the line who needs some help with a crawl space. Tell us about it. Okay. Um, I just recently purchased a home, 
And in part of the basement, I have a crawl space. And when the inspector came in to do the inspection on the house, he recommended that I put plastic down and to close the vents. Um, when I was listening to your guys' show the other day, I noticed that you guys said something about keeping the vents open so nothing ventilates into the house. So I was just kind of trying to find out, you know, you know, which direction should I go? What kind of plastic should I use? You know, and does it sound like a good idea? Okay, so so let me clarify for you. First of all, putting a plastic vapor barrier down across the floor of a crawl space is always a good idea. Use the plastic visqueen, the big wide sheets, overlap them about three feet. You know, try to get as much of that surface covered. What you're doing is preventing some of the evaporation of soil of, of moisture up through the soil. So that's a good thing. In terms of the vents, the vents should be open throughout most of the year, except per- perhaps just the coldest months of the winter. So if you closed it, say, November and December and maybe January, that would be okay. But for the rest of the year, those vents should be open because it helps take the moisture out. Now, I also have insulation up in the rafters of the floor joists. Is it a good idea to put or to seal that with any kind of plastic at all, or should I leave those exposed? Nope. No, you can leave it exposed just like that. It it needs to ventilate. Okay. Good deal. All right. Good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Hey, guys, if you've heard a helpful tip or two while listening to our show, please help us help even more home improvers by dropping us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That would be awesome, and you might even win a copy of our book, My Home, My Money Pit, your guide to every home improvement adventure. Just go to moneypit.com slash review. Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives but if you come with me you'll know everything i promise oh my God, go, go, go. monarch legacy of monsters streaming november 17th only on apple tv plus hey guys if you reach out to us with your home improvement questions at 888 money pit or at moneypit.com slash ask we will toss your name into the money pit hard hat for a great giveaway because we've got from our friends at Deitch Coatings the Marble Dream Resurfacing Kit. It's a roll-on marble resurfacing kit. It's great for countertops, for vanities, and for tabletops. It's very easy to apply. You don't need any special skills. Basically, everything you need is in the kit, and you'll get a very tough, resilient marble surface as a result. It's worth $169, but going out for free to one lucky listener. Reach out to us with your questions at moneypit.com slash ask or call us at 1-888-MONEYPIT. All right, now we're going over to Michigan where Linda's on the line and wants to add on to a farmhouse. How can we help you with that? Well, I have about a 100-year-old farmhouse, and I the only bathroom is upstairs. It's a, a two-story farmhouse, and I want to age in place. Uh, so I want to add another bathroom downstairs, and also uh, I inherited a doll collection from my mother, and it's stored in all the storage and all the rooms, so I kind of want to bring it into one room and add another room for that and hobbies. Uh, people have been suggesting that I just, oh, just add a, break up one of the rooms in the house and just put a bathroom in any, any old place, but the rooms are really well proportioned. There's good cross ventilation. I, I don't want to have a mess. I want to have some style to the additions. So people have suggested that I go to either an architect or a drafter or interior designer. I don't know. I, I'm not sure what that process involves and how many I should go to. Or Well, I think that you hit the nail on the head, and that is to hire an architect, because essentially you want to make sure that whatever you do to this house flows and maintains its structural integrity as well as its design integrity. So an architect can help you do just that. Selecting where to put that bathroom will be you know, a, a balance of compromises, trying to decide where it fits best, best in the design, where the plumbing is now, what it would take to get to the plumbing where it needs to be to, for this particular bathroom, and then how best to design those rooms for your collections and, and that sort of thing. The, the architect can handle with the structure and the mechanical systems. Once that's done, then you can consider bringing in an interior designer to help lay it out, choose colors, choose furniture, and, and, and make it work for you visually. Well, and I think the other good thing about bringing in the architect is they may have an interior designer that they work with. You can bring in your own 
they'll be able to sort of work together to help you specify the right materials for the right areas. So it really is a strong partnership. I see. Now, do I bring, do I talk or consult with two architects and get their ideas or do I just go with one and and get the designs? What I would do is I would, I would bring in one or two or maybe three architects to see the property, tell them what you want to accomplish, find out how they work. You get a feel for them. Yeah, they get a feel for you, and then you make a decision based on that. I think you meet with somebody, you meet with two or three architects, as Tom suggested. Just get a feel for them, because you're going to know if you want to work with them. You're going to know how well you communicate back and forth. You'll sort of spitball ideas you know, there during that meeting and get a really good sense of how much they're understanding you. And whoever you feel the most comfortable with, I think, is is what's going to lead you to the right decision. And then you'll start drawings. Okay. Um, I did get... Uh a card from someone he used him, but he's this person. But he was his card says he's a drafting and cons, drafting and uh, consultant. You don't want a drafter, okay? You want an architect. You just want an architect, a good quality architect. So focus on that first. You could take usually they'll have books that show some of their past projects. You can see what kind of work they do. You know, it's going to be you'll figure out through a process of elimination which one you're most comfortable with and that's the person that's going to get the job but they're well worth the investment because they're going to make this process easy and they're going to be you're going to be assured that it that it comes out exactly as you as you plan you know if you bring in if you go right to the contractor step they're just going to squeeze this bathroom in wherever uh, they think it fits and it's just you're not going to be happy with it so get the architect they're well worth their investment okay great good luck with that project thanks so much for calling us at 888 money pit Well, if you own an older home, would you buy another old home the next time around? A new survey by All Star Home says maybe not. That's right. Across the country, 55% of us actually live in homes that are more than 30 years old. And on average, owners of older homes spend $10,700 in repairs and maintenance Every year. I'm pretty sure I spend more than that, but that's just the average number. (laughs) In fact, that survey found that Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Pennsylvania are the top five states with the oldest homes in America. And most interesting here is that the survey asked, would you purchase another old home? And the split was about 50-50, with 52% saying that they would opt for an old home again, and 48% saying that they'd pass. And if you're wondering which states have the newest homes, maybe you just want to totally get away from old homes, period. Well, those states would be Nevada, Arizona, Alaska, Florida, and the great state of Texas. Jim in Pennsylvania is on the line with moisture. What's going on over at your money pit? Okay, I live in an old home, has a wraparound porch. The only wall that's exposed is, that goes out to the end of the porch, is our backyard. Um, my backyard slopes very gently downhill. It's been landscaped with several swales, and I never have standing water in my yard. I have no drainage that goes out the back or anything. Um, matter of fact, I've lived here for 30, 40 years, and I've never had water in my basement until five years ago when we had a tropical storm come up the coast, come inland, and dump almost 20 inches of rain right on us. But two years ago, I had the same thing happen. This one dumped about 10 inches of rain. Okay. Okay. I water both times that I had to get out of there, out of my basement, which is finished. But anyhow, my walls, even during those storms, my exposed walls and other walls are completely dry, and the water is coming up through, it looks like, the back side starting towards the middle of the back wall through the floor. It, it must, I'm thinking it's groundwater. It's not. It's clearly not. And I know that with absolute certainty because it's tied in with uh, precipitation. Whenever you have heavy rain and you get any type of leakage, it's always drainage. It starts from the top, works its way down. It just happens to be showing up. Uh, under the floor. That can very easily happen because water can accumulate outside the foundation wall. Sometimes it it goes into the walls and leaks through the walls. Sometimes it goes around the walls and pushes up through the floor. I've seen geysers show up in the middle of basement floors 
because somebody had a blocked gutter on the other side of the house. Water does strange things. But this is a drainage problem. That's all it is. So you need to, to look at your drainage very, very carefully. Now, you mentioned that you had a swale, and I hope that swale is still working for you. If that swale is not working just by the swale itself, you may have to install what's called a curtain drain at the bottom of that swale to collect the excess water and run it around your house and then dump it out to uh, a, a place that's lower on, on the lot. The other basic things that you can look at, and the very easiest thing is to look at, is your gutters. You need to have at least one downspout for every 400 to 600 square feet of roof surface. And those downspouts need to be extended four to six feet from the house minimum, minimum, not just out a foot into a splash block, but four to six feet away. I say that because whenever you have a water problem, we've got to move that water away from that first four foot or so of soil at around, that's around the foundation perimeter. So gutters are really important. Downspout discharge is really important. And then finally, the slope of the soil at the foundation perimeter is is important. But if you manage and maintain and improve the drainage conditions around the foundation perimeter, you won't have enough water to push up around those walls and into the floor. Okay. Okay. So a sump sump pump wouldn't work? No. I mean, a sump pump will take the water out once it gets there, but it doesn't deal with with stopping it from getting there in the first place. Right. And by the way, putting a sump pump in doesn't do anything to improve the uh, structural integrity of the foundation because, again, that water has to go around that foundation to get to where the pump is. So deal with the drainage, keep that soil as dry as possible, and you'll make the whole thing go away. Okay. Thank you. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Oh, come on now. You know you deserve it. A steak patty on any McDonald's breakfast sandwich. I mean, any breakfast sandwich. Biscuit, McMuffin, Bagel, McGriddles, a juicy steak patty on any breakfast sandwich. And when you order through the app, buy one and get one free. Now go get them. Valid for product of equal or lesser value. Limited time only at participating McDonald's. Valid one time per day. Excludes one, two, three dollar menu. All right, we've got Esther on the line from South Dakota with a gutter question. How can we help you today? Well, we need to replace our rain gutters. But our shingles on our dearly beloved old house are Portland cement shingles. And the first three people that are the first three companies that I've talked to about replacing rain gutters, they would tell me how simple it is to just lift up the asphalt shingles and put the strapping in underneath it and fasten it. And I think, okay, asphalt is flexible, but I think the cement shingles might crack. So how do I find someone who knows how about preserving the shingles and putting up new ring gutters. Well, I, I think there are, way, there are a number of ways to install gutters. You can put straps uh, that go up under the asphalt shingles, but you can, they can also be attached directly. So what you're going to want to do is attach those gutters directly to the fascia. And instead of using nails, you're going to want to use gutter screws. They're very long lag bolts, lightweight, thin lag bolts. Usually they have a hex head on them. And the nice thing about these, uh, these gutter bolts, so to speak, is that once you put them in, they don't pull out. Sometimes the nails, the gutter spikes that they use will pull out, but these gutter screws will not pull out. So you just need to use a different fastening system. Uh, and uh, if you have you had physically had somebody at the house that saw this configuration, or are they just kind of telling you this on the phone? No, we, we had just moved to the area, and I was just going down the yellow page, just, you know, trying yeah. to get it. Well, once they get to your house, they're going to figure out the best ways to attach the gutter. But rest assured, there's a number of ways to do this. And no, you don't have to take your shingles apart. And by the way, as long as those shingles, those roof shingles look good, and then there's no reason to replace them. You know, the cementitious uh, roof shingles are very durable. The reason that most people replace them is they tend to grow a lot of algae and moss, and they can look nasty after a while. But if they're still looking decent and they're, it's not leaking, then you're good to go. Go. Yep, we're good, and there's a whole pile of, uh, or a little pallet, probably two or three hundred of them down in the basement. So, Oh, boy. <laughs> so you're, you, have you are good to go. Storm, we should have some shingles. Yeah. All right, Esther, thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. All right, now we've got Barry in Iowa on the line who's got a question about 
a bathroom with carpeting, and I know your question's really about a pet, but bathroom with carpeting? What's going on, Barry? Well, the, the dogs were locked up in the bathroom when we went shopping. But when we come back, they tore a hole. It wasn't a, a big hole, but it's probably two and a half inches by three inches long, and I can't cover it in a way. And so I was wanting to tear the carpet up and put in new carpet because I can't match the old carpet. And uh, then, but I don't know how to put a threshold down in there. Well, first of all, um, putting carpet in the bathroom is generally a bad idea because obviously it doesn't mix with the moisture, even if it's an indoor outdoor style carpet. I don't know what you have, but I, I would recommend against carpet in a bathroom. So the dogs may have done you a favor because it's forcing you to take that carpet up. Your question is, how do you put a threshold like in the door? so that you would have like a clean edge. Yeah, well, I mean, you cer- certainly what you basically do is you put in a door sill there, and it sits even with the door when it's closed, so it's about as thick as the door plus another inch or so, so it's usually a couple of inches thick, and it may be higher on one side where the carpet is and lower on the other side where the floor is, but it's a pretty standard uh, piece of carpentry work or a pretty standard piece of a, of a carpet installation project, and I would recommend that you remove that carpet from the bathroom and put in a different type of, of flooring. What's underneath that carpet? Is there tile under there now? No, it's a cement slab. It's a slab house. Okay, so then what you might want to think about doing is putting in something like a laminate floor. Now, laminate can look like tile or it could look like stone, but it's very moisture resistant, so it's a terrific choice for the bathroom. And if you want something to kind of warm it up, then put a throw rug on top of it. But I wouldn't put carpet back. Yeah, well, that, that's what we were thinking, too. Yep, very simple step, uh, putting in a door sill is all you need to do. And if you don't know how to do it yourself, I'm sure your installer could help. I don't have to nail a threshold to the door, I mean to the floor? Oh no, it'll, it'll, it'll be secured to the floor, but there's lots of ways to do that. And there's a, there's a way that you can screw through the threshold with a special screw called a Tapcon fastener and it will secure it to the floor. Uh, you know, there are, there are ways. And then there's a piece that snaps over it. There's, if you go into your home center, um, Home Depot, Lowe's, or whatever you've got near you, in the flooring aisle, there's going to be at the end, you'll see wood, metal. They'll be called transitions. It'll be like from carpet to wood. It'll have all the varieties of one surface to the other surface and all the different ways to install them. They're pretty easy. Oh, well, thank you guys for the information, and I hope you have a good day. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Well, sprinkler systems are a luxury that affords you a beautiful green lawn and garden all during the spring and summertime. But if you live in a climate where they need to be winterized, it's a job that has to be done correctly, or you could be facing a big repair bill come springtime. That's right. So there are really three ways to winterize a sprinkler system, manual, automatic, and what's simply called blowout. The first step in all cases, though, is to turn off the water supply. Now, for the manual approach, you want to open the drain valves and allow the water to drain out. But keep in mind that sometimes water is still under a lot of pressure and will come out very quickly at first, so don't stand in the way of it. For automatic, the drain valves are located at the end of the run and the low points of the irrigation plumbing. These are going to automatically open and drain water, so you don't do much for this uh, if the pressure of the piping is less than 10 PSI. To activate them, just shut off the water supply, and the rest, it should happen automatically. And lastly, and my preferred method, is what's called blowout. This is usually done by a pro, and it uses forced air to make sure all the water has been removed. Because let's face it, if those pipes are not perfectly pitched you're going to get water that remains in them. I like the blowout option because it pretty much does just that. It blows out all the water. They're completely dry when you're done, and you don't have to worry about any water sitting in there because if it does, you know what's going to happen. It's going to freeze, expand, and break the pipe, and you don't want to deal with that in the spring. All right, so get it done right so you don't end up with your own version of the Frozen movie, except with <laughs> a lot of water. <laughs> all right, next up we've got Mark on the Money Pit. What's going on at your house? Okay, I've got this house that I bought. Um, it's like just less than five acres um, by the golf course in Bandon, Oregon. Okay. And I've got these pavers that um, somebody has laid over something. Um, it's about 2,000 square feet of them in my front yard. Wow. And it's not a small house. So I'm trying to figure out what to nuke this moss that is impending because I've got a lot of huge <laughs> trees here, too. It's got, yeah. I've got everything, guys. 
This is Oregon. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, and I've got the, the salt fog, which is a phenomenon I've never even heard of before. Here's what I think you should do. First of all, since you have so much of this, we're not just trying to strategically get rid of a little bit. I would use a, uh, a mildecide on this. I would use something like jo- Jomax, which is a Zinzer product. You mix it up with bleach. You put it across these pavers, and you leave it sit, and it'll basically kill all of the moss and the algae and, and so on in a fairly short period of time. You can power wash it and clean it up after that. Now, um, on an ongoing basis, though, there are different types of products. There is spray and forget, for example, that you can apply to it. And if you do this every every month or two, that will stop the moss from uh, growing as quickly. But whenever you have a lot of shade like that, of course, the conditions are perfect uh, for that type of moss and algae and lichen and lichen to grow. So the first step is going to be to kind of nuke it, so to speak, <laughs> with a really strong process. And then you're going to apply um, a more gentle product like spray and forget to try to stop it from uh, coming back. There is hope. <laughs> there sure is. Always. There is. There is. Well, good luck with that project. Thanks so much for reaching out to us at 188 Money Pit. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. This hour, we've got a great reason to reach out to Team Money Pit. Up for grabs is a Marble Dream resurfacing kit from Deich Coatings. Now, this is a great kit because if you've got an old countertop or maybe a piece of furniture that you want to turn into a vanity or anything that you want to make look like it has a marble surface, this is the kit for you. With the Marble Dream resurfacing kit, you really are going to get some beautiful, realistic, professional results. You do not have to be an artiste to have wonderful, accomplished skills at the end of this. It really is gorgeous. And whether you like one that's super veiny or just as soft and swirly, you can create that. There's some great color choices out there. Check it out. You can see what the before and afters look like at DeichCoatings.com. That's D-A-I-C-H Coatings.com. And it's a kit worth $169, but it could be yours for free just by asking us a question this hour. Jill in Washington's on the line with a question about a foundation. What's going on in your money pit? We're having a small house built up here in the, the great, beautiful state of Washington, and the builder is recommending a double set of, how do I say it, for drainage. He wants to really be sure that the drainage all is tight-lined. Uh, one, one system will be tight-lined that joins with the downspouts from the roof, and then the other is kind of like a perforated uh, long 200-foot piece of hose with a sleeve over it. Do you recommend both of those? Is that overkill, or how would you do it? So we're talking about uh, surface drainage here, or we're talking about gutter drainage, or both. Uh, these sounds like, from your description, that these are all running away from the house. Is that right? Yes. He wants it around the they've they've simply just finished the foundation and are about to do the backfill before they do the backfill they want two drainage systems put in place one is a hard i'm not sure of the correct terminology it's a four inch yeah, one's for the downspouts and one's for the foundation is that correct correct exactly right. no i mean i think he's doing it right and those those steps will help the the one really important thing is that when he's done with this is not only do those downspouts have to be extended away from the house, but you want to make sure that that finished grade also has a pitch that drops at least about six inches over the first four feet because with new construction, you'll get a lot of settlement and you got to have good pitch. But if you have downspouts that are extended out away from the house and you have good pitch, you'll never have to worry about a water infiltration problem. And I also don't suspect that those additional foundation drains will really come into use much, if at all. But since it's all fully open right now, there's no really, there's no harm in doing that. Okay. So, so it's just bite the bullet and just put both systems in. Yeah. Now, uh, have they put the gutters in yet? Oh no no the house isn't even built yet no okay just the- so here's a here's a good tip most builders are going to put in what's called a four inch K style gutter that's a standard gutter opt for the next size up it's a six inch gutter for two reasons number one it uh, it holds more runoff from your roof it doesn't get overwhelmed and number two it doesn't clog as easily because the downspouts are much bigger. I see. What a great tip. Okay, and they're not that much more expensive either. Great. Well, you know what? When we get to that point, I'm going to call the show back uh, and because it will 
always rains up here, and I will let you know that we took your grand advice and how it all came out. All right. right. Can't wait. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Good luck with that brand new home. Thank you so much. Building a new money pit. Building something new that will become a money pit. That's right. That's right. As beautiful and luxurious as these homes are, we know that everybody's house becomes a money pit sooner or later. And so that's why we're in the money pit prevention business. Well, when it comes to maintaining your home, painting or even staining those wood surfaces is important to keep your siding and trim in good shape. But while painting is a task that's among the most basic of DIY projects, it's also one where simple mistakes can lead to big heartache. Yeah, and the key comes down to preparation. You know, if you have weathered surfaces, they need to be cleaned and any loose paint removed before you even think about opening a can of paint. If not, the new paint simply won't stick. You can't put good paint over bad paint. So if it's weathered, you've got to get it off. And if you try to paint over it, all that new paint is just going to chip off and you will have wasted all of your efforts. Now, next, it's always smart to apply a coat of primer first. Now, primer is formulated differently than paint, which is meant to be the finished coat. Primer is going to have better adhesion, so it will stick to those old surfaces better and then prevent that new paint from peeling off. And finally, for the best finish look, be sure to choose the right kind of paint brush. There are major differences. Now, natural bristle brushes are best for applying oil-based paints, but for latex, synthetic bristle brushes deliver the best results and help maintain the value of your home. The other day, Leslie, I got a question from a listener to our blog. Uh, We had mentioned using a cut-in brush, and she didn't understand what a cut-in brush was. And I thought it would be a good time to mention that a cut-in brush is typically a synthetic bristle brush that has an angled top to it. So it allows you to get in tight to corners and other places that you want to sort of cut into with the paint. So get the right type of brush, and the job will go a lot better. Marty reached out to Team Money Pit and says, This past summer, I had an air conditioning issue that caused a large amount of water to overflow the drain pan in my attic. The water that overflowed caused the popcorn ceiling covering to come down and the drywall on the ceiling to bow. How do I replace the drywall, and is there a way to restore that popcorn finish? Ah, yes, very good question. So, Marty, here's the thing. Of course, it sounds like you've dealt with the leak that goes without saying Uh, An overflowing drain pan in an attic air conditioner is a very common leak, so no worries there if you fixed it. But in terms of that drywall, once it's swollen like that, once it's, it's bowed down, then it has to be cut out completely. And by the way, if, however, you were there when this was happening and had the opportunity to take action, when the water starts to come through the drywall, the first thing you should do is grab a screwdriver and poke a couple of holes right where that's happening. That happened to me when we had a huge storm that actually had a tree branch that fell on the roof, caused a break, and we had a lot of water that got into the ceiling. I saw it happening. I quick got a bucket and poked a hole in the ceiling. I let out two and a half gallons of water, and the drywall never moved, never moved an inch because I got the water out of there. So get the water out when that happens. Now, once the drywall is replaced, you need to restore that textured ceiling. DAP has a product designed especially for this. It's called the 2-in-1 Wall and Ceiling Spray Texture, and they do have a version of it that's simply called Popcorn. Very easy for you to apply, especially in a small area like that. And once that's done, you can paint the entire ceiling, and that will make it all blend together, and you will be good to go. Yeah, and surprisingly, you know, those popcorn ceilings, they're difficult-ish to remove. They're difficult-ish to match. You don't want to take it down. You want to repair it. Does it look good? I mean, this new DAP product definitely helps you achieve the best possible repair. So really, a good way to approach maintaining that popcorn ceiling and keeping that look without having to do a ton more work. Plus, it's just going to look awesome. So good luck with that. And, uh, you know, next time, like Tom says, poke some holes in the ceiling. Yes, we give you permission to temporarily destroy your ceiling. (laughs) It's for the good. Well, when you start up your dishwasher, are the dishes coming out dirtier than when they went in? The culprit could be a clogged drain valve, and that's something that's easy to fix. Leslie has advice on how to do just that in today's edition of Leslie's Last Word. Leslie, important tip, considering that the holidays are just in front of us. And you know what? Dishwashers do have this drain valve, and they should only open during that draining cycle. But the problem is that sometimes these valves get clogged, and then they start to let water out during the wash cycle as well. 
So you kind of have to listen to make sure that this isn't happening. So during that wash cycle, if you hear water flowing into the sink, that drain valve is definitely clogged and definitely stuck open. Also, you want to check the bottom of your dishwasher for any buildup of food particles. A lot of dishwashers have ball-style check valves that can get gummed up and prevent dirty water from draining out of the unit. A wet dry vac is truly all you're going to need to clean out those hard-to-reach areas and get that drain working again. Bottom line, this type of maintenance, this type of repair, this type of attention to your dishwasher, it's not hard. And with just a couple of steps, those clogs can be fixed and then those dishes are going to come clean again. So great idea to sort of just get the work done yourself on the dishwasher. And no need to call in a plumber or an appliance repair person, especially around the holidays when they charge a lot of money to come to your house. You are listening to the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. Coming up next time on the program, you know, your roof weathers every storm and it protects your home structure and keeps you warm and dry, but it doesn't last forever. We're going to tell you what to do when your roof's got to go on the very next edition of the Money Pit. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. 